Hi, my name is John Consalvi, and I'm the CEO of Lingua Health. I'm here today to talk to Dr. Elizabeth Pena about a test she helped develop called the BESA. Elizabeth Pena is the George Christian Centennial Professor in Communication at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on two lines of inquiry that address the goal of differentiating language impairment from language difference. These two interrelated areas include dynamic assessment and semantic development in bilingual. Feel free to view all of my interview questions on Lingua Health's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy our videos and please feel free to share them with your friends. What does BESA mean? BESA stands for the Bilingual English Spanish Assessment, and in Spanish it also means kiss. So we designed a logo for it, which has a child blowing a kiss and the letters B-E-S-A coming out. Why did you and your team develop the BESA assessment? The BESA was developed because there were very few tests specifically for bilingual kids, and we wanted to develop something that um, incorporated children who spoke English and Spanish into the norms and where we really targeted items that were difficult for Spanish and were difficult for English for kids with language um, impairments. Can you tell us about the norming process of the BESA? What we did is we started out with a large set of items. So in semantics, for example, we started out with over 100 items in each language. Now, no clinician wants to give 100 items on a test, but it helps us to figure out which items work well and which items don't work well, and we throw out the items that don't work well. And then we take those items and give them to another set of kids, and we keep building the norm and throwing out items so that at the end, we end up with a test that has a length that is clinically acceptable. So the best of the whole thing takes about an hour and 15 minutes if you give it in both languages and does a really good job of separating kids with and without speech impairments and a really good job separating kids. How does the BESA test different from other tests? Well, there's a couple of things. The biggest thing is that we figured out a way of combining Spanish and English scores. So on semantics, for example, we allow conceptual scoring, um, which a couple of tests are starting to do. Um, the other thing that we did is we have a composite score that incorporates the stronger or the best um, semantic score with the best morphosyntax score. And together that composite might incorporate, say, um, English semantics and Spanish morphosyntax. Because sometimes kids are in the process of learning English as a second language. They get to the point where they know more vocabulary in English than they do in Spanish but they still are better in um, grammar in Spanish. And so we needed to come up with a way of combining those two. And so that's something that we did that it's re that's really unique to us. Why select markers? Why not test more broadly? I think early in test development, people did test um, a domain really broadly to try to sample um, everything that was represented in a domain. I think over time we've realized that in language impairment and in speech impairment there are certain things that are particularly difficult for children um, with language or speech impairments. And so what you want to do is you want to build a test that um, identifies those markers. You want to build a test that loads on those markers so that it's really clear which kids have language impairment and which kids don't have language impairment. If you test broadly, those tests help us to look at broader patterns of language performance, but they usually don't do a very good job of accurately classifying children with and without impairments. Why is sensitivity and specificity important in test selection? You want to be really confident of your measure. So you don't want to measure where um, you're only 60% sure that the child has an impairment. You want to be, well, if, if possible, you want to be 100% sure. Now, no test is perfect, um, but you want to have a test that is really sensitive to the disorder. So standards are at least 80% sensitive um, or 90% sensitive. Those are 
90% would be considered very good or excellent sensitivity. And at the same time, you want to be able to say, well, this child scored really well on this test. They definitely don't have an impairment. And so that's um, specificity. So you want to have 80, 90% or better specificity. Um, and that tells you the confidence that you have in believing um, the score that you get and making a diagnostic decision on the basis of that score. Tell me about the pragmatics in the BESA. Well, the pragmatics subtest of the BESA is a test that I really like. It's not a norm test, it's more descriptive, um, but it starts out with you asking the child to help you wrap a present for your friend. And a lot of kids really enjoy that, especially children who are a little bit shy or who've never participated in individualized testing before. Um, it's a really good warm-up activity. It takes seven minutes or so to give, and you set up these situations where um, there's not any tape in the tape dispenser or the ribbon that you're using to wrap the you know, to wrap around the present is a little bit too short, and doesn't fit around the box. Um, or you hand the child the wrong color ribbon and they have to tell you, oh, um, the ribbon's too short, can you give me another one? Or, oh no, there's no tape in the dispenser. So you're trying to test whether or not they notice those things and whether they use language to indicate to you that you needed to have done something a little bit different. Some kids um, we've noticed are um, e with adults might be a little bit shy or polite um, and they'll just kind of go along with whatever you give them even if it's not quite right and so we've learned with some of those kids to use a puppet and to say you know I have this puppet and sometimes he's really silly so you have to watch him and make sure that he doesn't fool you and then the puppet does the wrong thing and then the child can correct the puppet so it's a really nice warm-up task it's a really nice way of getting kids involved in um, helping you wrap this gift, and they um, seem to really enjoy it. Can you tell me a little bit about the morphosyntax in the BESA? Well, the morphosyntax test is interesting. It has two subsections. One is a close um, test, so um, this girl has a flower, and here this girl has, and it would be flowers or three flowers, and we're trying to test the plural S for example. The other um, part of the test has sentence repetition. Um, one of the things that we did is we identified markers of impairment for Spanish and markers of impairment for English, and those are different. So in Spanish, things like a direct object clitic is really difficult. Um, in English, things like past tense ED or the ING form or the plural S forms are difficult, and so we loaded on those kinds of items for each of the two tests. Do the Spanish and English versions of the test focus on the same kinds of grammar? No, they don't. So um, in Spanish, it focuses thing on things like noun morphology, gender agreement. Um, for example, you have to make sure that um, the article is feminine and that the um, noun is feminine and that the article is plural and that the noun is plural so you have to have that level of detail and agreement and so that's important and so we test that. Um, clitics are really important and so we test those. Um, in English we tested things that were more um, focused on verb morphology so things like um, past tense, present progressive um, were things that we tested for English. So they're um, looking at different things and they're looking at things that are difficult for children with language impairment to learn. Tell me a little bit about the phonology in the BESA. The, there's two versions of that, again, one in Spanish and one in English. And we test the sounds of each of the two languages, and we test them using the patterns of the two languages. So I think everybody knows that Spanish has lots of um, long words, so multisyllabic words, um, but there aren't a lot of um, blends, and there aren't a lot of sounds that are permitted in the final um, position of syllables. And so we 
built a test that really represents Spanish, the way that Spanish is constructed, and then another version that represents English, the way that English is constructed. And how are the Spanish and English sections of the test similar and different? Across the two tests, we selected items that are similar in difficulty, and we only selected items that um, maximize differences between children with and without language impairment. So this is a test for four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and six-year-olds. And so we looked at item difficulty for each of those three ages. And then we have items that are, um, for example, that have a, a difficulty level of 0.8 for four-year-olds for Spanish and then for four-year-olds for English. And so it might be two different items, but psychometrically they have the same difficulty level. And so we do the same thing to represent items for five-year-olds and to represent items for six-year-olds. And all the items have um, uh, discriminant functions or um, discrimination values um, that um, show differences or distinctions in performance between children with and without language impairment. How do you put the English and the Spanish versions of the BESA together? We do a couple of things. Um, we test in both languages for the most part, unless the child is clearly dominant in one language or the other. Um, and then subtest by subtest, we will compare and um, take the higher score between the two versions. So in phonology, if English is higher, then we take the, phonology, the English phonology score. In morphosyntax, if um, Spanish is higher, we'll take the Spanish score. In semantics, if English is higher, for example, we take the English score. And then we put those together into a composite. So that composite can represent both Spanish and English, as long as it's the higher score by each domain. And then your composite score represents both of those. And it's a, a total score that should tell you where the child is in terms of their um, language ability or their speech ability. How does the clinician decide which language to test? We include an interview um, for parents and for teachers where we ask them hour by hour what language the child uses and what language the child hears. So we ask things like, what time does the child get up? And maybe that's 7 o'clock, and so then who are they with? And what language does that person use with the child? And what language does the child use with them? Because it could be that the parent uses Spanish, but the child uses English. And so we take that hour by hour sampling of a typical day during the week and a typical day during the weekend and put that together to represent a seven day week and get a proportion of use of Spanish um, exposure to Spanish, use of English, and exposure to English. And on that basis, we have some guidelines that will tell clinicians what language to use. So basically, if children are using Spanish and English at least 30% of the time, we recommend that you test in both because it's very common that kids will have mixed dominance. If they're using one of their languages at least 70% of the time or more, then you're can get really good results just testing in that one language. Can you use only parts of the BESA? Yes, you can. So phonology, for example, is a standalone subtest. And um, you can get a standard score from that. And you can make a decision if you think that it's only, that the referral is only about phonology, then you could give that subtest alone. And um, that's interpretable. You don't need to. Um, give the entire test. If you think it's more about language, then you could give the semantics and the morphosyntax subtests and get a composite for language and, um, and use that without phonology. Um, if you think it's about pragmatics and you want to do um, some social interaction observations, then you could use pragmatics, but you don't have to give it. It's not standardized, so you don't need to include it in your final test. So how long does it take to give the BESA in its entirety? If you 
give the whole thing in Spanish and in English and include all the sections. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half to give the entire test. How do you decide what parts of the BESA to give? Um, we have another questionnaire and this one is called the ITALK, so it's the Inventory to Assess Language Knowledge. Um, and we ask parents about um, the child's speech, about the child's um, comprehension, about their expressive language, about their vocabulary knowledge. And um, we, st we started out asking parents about whether they had concerns or not about their child's language. And parents were somewhat inconsistent in reliably telling us whether they, what their concerns were. So sometimes they had concerns, but they were concerned because their child wasn't very polite with other people. Um, sometimes they had concerns because there were other kinds of things going on. And sometimes they had concerns because they have a speech or language impairment or um, a concern around that. But if we ask parents really carefully, tell me about your child's vocabulary. Do they use a lot of words? Um, do they only use a few words? Then they're really able to pinpoint what area um, would need to be tested. And so we use that test to kind of guide us um, in interviewing the parent and, and also interviewing the teacher to figure out what area of speech or language should be tested. What type of feedback have you received from people that have used the BESA? People are really excited about it. Um, I think it's a test that's pretty unique. Um, it, ha it incorporates grammar, which is something that um, a lot of the tests for bilinguals don't do, um, aren't doing just yet. Most of them focus more on um, semantics or on vocabulary. Um, people are pretty excited about it. Um, they've had questions about the scoring and how to put the scoring together across the two languages. Um, they find that it's giving them pretty consistent um, results and results that they think are representative of what the child can do, and so I think that's really important. Um, some people wish we had um, started with three-year-olds and not four-year-olds. Um, some people wish we tested all the way through 15 or 16 years old, um, but we're going to hopefully get there too. Um, so um, I think pretty much the response has been positive. And then people have helped us find typos and things like that. So um, whenever there's a new printing, we try to fix whatever things that are wrong people find. Hopefully there's nothing else um, left that um, is wrong in the printing, but those things happen. And it makes me crazy, but it does. Do you have any future plans for the BSA? Actually, we do. So we are in the process of um, finishing up a screener and um, the screener will go from three years old to uh, 10. Um, the first screener that's going to hopefully come out in the fall is going to address kids three, four, five, six years old and then we have plans for screen, well we already have data for screeners for first, second, third, fourth and fifth grade kids. Um, so that's one plan. And then we also got a grant from the National Institutes of Health, oh, 10 years or so ago to develop an upward extension. So we developed items, we tested kids in um, first, second and third grade. And we're going to, we're in the process of um, norming and looking at those norms. And so I hope that that test will be available in the next couple of years. Are there any plans for expanding the standardization of the BESA? We're always testing more kids with the test. And so probably yes. So we're, we have um, colleagues in California and in um, Florida and in other states where there are lots of kids who are Spanish English speakers and so um, we've always allowed other researchers to use our test and they've been really great about sharing their data with us and so as we go along we have continued and will continue to expand um, the norm normative group. What other measures do you recommend 
that would go in tandem with the delivery of the BESA in evaluating bilingual children? The BESA, I think, is one test in a very small handful of tests that are appropriate for kids. So um, the self-Spanish is a really nice test that has good sensitivity and specificity. The PLS Spanish is another test that has very nice sensitivity and specificity. Um, and the CPAC-S, um, coincidentally, by Brian Goldstein and Aquiles Iglesias, also has really nice sensitivity and specificity for um, Arctic and phonology. So those are some tests that I think are very appropriate. I also think, of course, dynamic assessment is something you can use to fill in and test children, um, children's ability to respond to a sh very short-term intervention. Um, and we, I had developed um, a narrative version of dynamic assessment in collaboration with Ron Gillum and Linda Miller. Um, and we recently tried that out with bilingual kids and it works pretty well with them. Um, so I think those are some things that you can use. And of course, language sampling. So um, that's always the good gold standard. And we use and continue to use SALT um, to transcribe and to quickly do analyses of children's language in Spanish and English. The BESA test is a very useful tool. So where can clinicians find the BESA? You can purchase it through the publisher, and it's AR Clinical Publications. Um, you can purchase it online, through a PO, um, and you're just dealing directly with the publisher. We're hoping to get it out into other um, methods of delivery, um, but right now you can buy it directly from, from the publisher.